A very busy Monday here on NBC News Now, coming on the air right now with new Russian airstrikes in western Ukraine. Across the country from where Ukrainian and Russian troops are battling nonstop on the ground. And we are just learning that Moscow has launched a new offensive. Local officials say seven people are dead in Lviv, including a child. Coming up, the moment our NBC News team saw the rockets hit the city. Also breaking, a Florida judge says the CDC is not allowed to extend the federal mask mandate on planes for now. What should you know? What should you do if you're flying? We're going to have that story coming up. Plus, you know about April showers. What about snow? I'm from Colorado. I know about snow in April, but 8 million people could get hit with that on the East Coast. We'll have the forecast on who's in the path of this powerful storm. And the conspiracy theorist Alex Jones filing for bankruptcy as he's losing multiple defamation suits for his lies about the Sandy Hook school shooting. How that could affect the victim's families. Also, the U.S. faces a massive shortage of computer chips, and that is making it harder to get our hands around the newest tech. But Congress can't reach a deal on how to fix this problem. We're going to break it all down, just how urgently the supply chain issue is, how urgently we need it fixed, coming up later in the show. I'm Tom Costello, in for Hallie Jackson, and we start tonight in Ukraine, where we are just learning from the country's president that Russia is right now launching a new offensive in the east, just as they're attacking a city in the West that many believed was safe from the worst of this onslaught. We're talking about Lviv. You see it right there. The aftermath of these new missile strikes. Seven people dead, including a child. Another 11 are injured. NBC News can't confirm those no numbers independently, but Lviv's mayor now says there are no safe or unsafe places in Ukraine. This is a city many had seen as a, a safe haven for refugees as they safely pass to countries like Poland. The U.S. is also doing what it can to help those running from the violence with breaking news just now that the Biden administration will expand the eligibility of people seeking temporary protected status by six weeks. And that's happening as experts warn Maripol can fall any day now. Russia's defense ministry is demanding surrender. Ukrainian officials say Maripol is surrounded. We're going to warn you, the video we're going to show you is disturbing. But what we're showing you is, in fact, the reality right now on the ground in the cities. Bodies laid out on the street, covered in makeshift graves made from blankets. The Pentagon, though, says Ukraine has not yet given up on Maripol. The Ukrainians are still resisting. Uh, the city has not fallen to the Russians, uh, but they continue to pound it from the air and, and through uh, and through long range fires. It's not the only place we're seeing those heartbreaking images. This is Irpin, which is just outside of Kiev. Drone video here showing mass graves from those killed by Russia's attacks. Ali Rusi is in Lviv for us. Ali, you were in the middle of an interview today when missiles suddenly hit Lviv. Walk us through what happened. Uh, hi, Tom. That's right. We were in the middle of the interview with our crew. With uh, We were interviewing Malcolm Nance, terrorism expert. And all of a sudden, we heard a loud thud. Uh, and then the second time, there was this very disconcerting whistling sound. We looked up and we saw what I first thought was an airplane because it was so big, uh, fly over our head at an extraordinary speed. And then, bang, hit the ground. And immediately after, black smoke uh, came up from that, uh, from that area where it hit it. Uh, uh, it was it was quite frightening for everybody there seeing that in the city center of Lviv. I think we have some video from that moment. Let's take a look. Wait for one more. They're fired in yeah, thirty second intervals. They fire them in thirty second intervals. Smoke. There we go. Stand by. Oh, God, Three cruise missile caliber. Look. Stand by. There's the smoke. Here. That's three. So three cruise missiles. Yeah. So uh, give us a sense then, if you could, Ali, are people there in Lviv bracing for more of these attacks? And we should emphasize yet again, this is the western part of the country close to Poland. 
Uh, that's right, Tom. Look, this is, as you mentioned earlier, always been a safe zone for people that are displaced in this country seeking refuge here. That's uh, no longer the feeling. You know, this hit the center of Lviv. The other attacks that we've seen have always been on the outskirts. And where those missiles landed were very he heavily built up residential areas. And as you mentioned, they killed seven people. The first time people have been killed in Lviv. And part of that tragedy also was that a three year old boy who had uh, escaped Kharkiv with his mother was injured by that uh, attack. So uh, not spared in Kharkiv and not spared here in Lviv either. OK, let's talk about Mariupol, if we could, on the eastern part of the, the eastern part of the country, which has been under Russian assault. We understand that right now they are preparing for the city to fall. Uh, Ukraine is basically saying it would be the end of peace talks. And there are just a there's a very small number of Ukrainian forces that are holed up right now in some sort of a big uh, metals plant, if I understand it correctly. Right. They have already they've said they're going to fight to the end, to the death. That's exactly right, Tom. The, the Russians gave them an ultimatum, surrender or die, and they've chosen to fight to the death. They're the Azov Brigade there, very hardened military unit. They're holed up in that steel plant. And we've also heard that there are about a thousand women or children also hiding in the basement of that steel plant. And you think that's not the safest place for them to be, but there's no for Hey, Ali, we've lost you, uh, but thank you. Ali Rusi, who has been doing just yeoman's work there in Lviv, Ukraine. Uh, in just the last few minutes, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says that it is disappointing that a Florida judge has overturned the CDC mask mandate for planes, trains, and other forms of public transportation. That comes after the largest flight attendants union uh, went out this afternoon urging people to stay calm, be patient, until they get clarity on what to do after this ruling. The Justice Department, however, so far not commenting on whether the government might try to block the judge's order. The CDC, FAA, and the TSA say they are evaluating their options right now. By the way, New York City transit officials say uh, they will stick with the CDC guidelines until this is all figured out. It comes as nationwide officials are bracing for what the next few weeks could look like after families gather for holidays, students returned to classes after spring break, and new cases have been rising over the past two weeks. Look at that. Deaths have decreased, but let's now bring in Pete Williams to talk about the mask mandate issue. So a judge has said, sorry, this order isn't legal. This is what we should make the point is a Trump appointed judge. Uh, is is her word the last word or where might the administration go? Well, for now it is. It's the law. Uh, and so the administration has to decide whether they'll ask a federal appeals court. I mean, they can ask the judge right now to block her own order. That seems unlikely. So they go to the federal appeals court and ask for an emergency stay. That's what they could do, but they haven't said whether they will do it. A little surprising, I think, that it's taking them, I mean, relatively speaking, so long to say, because this surely was one possible outcome. This lawsuit was filed last July mm -hmm. by a conservative group and two women who say that they have to, they have to wear a mask and it causes them anxiety. One said it causes her panic attacks. And so the judge said the CDC doesn't have authority to do this under the public health law. And secondly, that the government short circuited improperly the law that requires them to seek public comment when it makes a rule like this. So for all those reasons, she said it's invalid. One other point, Tom, she said normally a judge would only rule in terms of the people who brought the lawsuit. But she said that doesn't make any sense here because how is a flight attendant or an Uber driver or a train conductor going to know whether these people were successful litigants in a lawsuit and don't have to wear the mask or not? So the only sensible way, she said, is to make it effective nationwide. So we're waiting to find out whether what steps the DOJ or the administration will take. Will right. they appeal this? Yes. Might it work to their advantage just to say, OK, um, we cry uncle. And the reason I ask that is they had extended the mask mandate for a, a few weeks, two and a half weeks, more or less. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it is universally panned at this point. Every airline wants to get rid of it. All the flight attendants believe that it, it's cr creating tension. So uh, can they just now lay this off on the judge, blame it on the judge and say, well, you know, it's up. She decided she ruled and we're going to have to abide by the decision. Well, I, I think that's a pretty good guess of what they may do. Uh, you know, the, the, the point is, 
This was a ruling on the merits of the case. This was not one of these temporary emergency things here. So, you know, they have to decide whether they want to let this judge's ruling stand. Always the risk if you go to an appeals court is if the appeals court upholds the judge's ruling, then it's an, either, it's an even bigger deal. So they may well just let it stand. T CDC is tonight saying it still recommends that people wear a mask. Yeah. But I, you know, people that are going to show up to take an airplane ride tonight or tomorrow morning, uh, if the airline says you have to wear a mask, they're going to say, well, a judge says I don't have to. Well, we should also remind the audience, the airlines had a mask mandate in place before it was ordered by the federal government. Yes. And now they, as you say, they don't want it anymore right. when it was due to expire, what, May 3rd, I guess. Right. Pete, thank you. You bet. Pete Williams. Uh, today, the Biden administration announcing a new plan to deal with the higher prices that you are paying at the pump by letting private companies restart oil and gas drilling, listen to this, on federal land. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki saying the decision is in part because of a court injunction that they are still trying to fight. We need to move towards a more clean energy economy, which he strongly believes in, but also because there are 9,000 permits un, uh, unused uh, on lands that could be tapped into by oil companies, and we don't feel they are needed. Okay, so here's how it's going to work. Today, the Interior Department is putting 144,000 acres of federal land up for auction for the first time since the president took office. But it comes with increased royalties, fees, that companies will have to pay. The first rate increase in more than a century. And here's the latest on gas prices right now. You can see the numbers looking positive. Prices are down from last week and last month, but it's still up more than a dollar from where we were a year ago. Josh Letterman is outside the White House. Josh, uh, experts you're talking to, they say they don't expect this plan to make any changes to gas prices for six months to a year. So why announce the plan now, if at all? Well, because fast forward to six months from now, Tom, and what do you find? Uh, the midterm elections. And the White House knows that every single voter who steps out of his or her home at some point in time is going to see a gas station where there are big neon lights showing the price of gas, and that that is a huge political problem for the president. Uh, and so they are working to show very clearly what they are doing, that the president is taking whatever steps are with his, within his discretion to try to bring those gas prices down, address the inflation inflation issues that we're seeing uh, across the country. And so even though some of these steps are going to really take years before they would even uh, start to see the effects of bringing ga down gas prices, the White House wanting to show they're doing what they can. If, in fact, if you rewind just a few days ago to when we were talking about the administration's decision to allow E15, which is a uh, biofuel that has ethanol to be blended into it, to be sold during the summer months, that is something, the whole product is only sold at a couple of thousand of gas stations across the country, a tiny fraction of the gas stations that we have in this country, and yet the Biden administration making a big deal out of it because they want to put front and center, this is what we are doing ahead of the elections to try to bring those prices down. Yeah, so only one and a half percent of gas stations actually offer ethanol. Exactly. Uh, it's going to have a very muted effect on the price of gas, and we know that this will have a very muted, if any, impact on the price of gas. And, but we should point out, the president directly made this a campaign pledge not to drill on federal lands, and you're talking with conservation groups who are pointing out that they're also pointing that out and criticizing the decision, but his hands are kind of tied up right now. That's exactly right. The environmental groups are not happy about this. The Sierra Club, in particular, put out a blistering statement about this. Uh, but I spoke to White House officials this morning who said uh, exactly what you said. Their hands are tied, that this resulted from a court injunction, uh, and they are required legally to hold these sales. They already did them uh, for the offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, now with on-land uh, federal leases. But they also say, look, that is why Interior Secretary Deb Holland has taken upon herself uh, to limit significantly the number of acres that can be offered in this sale, uh, as well as to increase uh, the royalties that energy companies have to pay so that at least the federal taxpayer is getting their money's worth uh, for putting these uh, this land up for sale. Okay, and this is happening as the administration is also laying out its new tax plan on the wealthy, but that's not something that can happen without Congress stepping in and, and making this official. 
That's exactly right. The White House and President Biden have long now been calling for this federal billionaires uh, minimum tax. They want to make sure that the wealthy, both individuals and large corporations, have to pay uh, a basic level of federal tax. But the reality is uh, President Biden doesn't necessarily even have all Democrats on board with that to be able to move that through Congress. Uh, and in fact, it is concerns from some of those uh, very members of the Senate, uh, uh, particularly Arizona's Kirsten Sinema, that has made it so difficult even to reverse those 2017 tax cuts uh, that Democrats have said were so overly favorable to the wealthy, Tom. Thanks, Josh. Smart guy there, huh? Josh Letterman, thank you. Uh, if you're someone who waits until the last minute to file your taxes, today is your day because it's the deadline to get them in by midnight or you have to file an extension. But the IRS is also under pressure, it says. It's facing its hardest tax season ever. Uh, since staffing shortages from the pandemic left about 8 million unprocessed returns from last year, still left to do this year, uh, IRS staffing was so short last year, about 15,000 employees handled over 240 million calls coming in during the first half of the year. Get this, that's 16,000 calls per minute, per person, I should say. So they're scrambling to find people, about 10,000 to be exact, people who want to work leaving people wondering, well, how long is it going to take until they see their money? Some people are still waiting on their refunds from two years ago. Joining me now is Jolene Kent, who uh, has been talking to folks about this. Joe, I, I talked to an IRS commissioner today who said that they need staff desperately. Their ranks have been depleted. And it's not just people to answer the phone and process returns. The IRS is, as you mentioned, looking for 10,000 people over the coming years, right? Yes, they're looking for 10,000 people that they hope to hire by the end of this year. We're talking about entry-level positions here to process 6 million individual tax returns, 5 million more than usual. And I interviewed the IRS Director of Talent Recruitment uh, the other day. Listen to this. How urgent is the need to hire 10,000 people? We want everyone to come work with the IRS tomorrow. <laughs> The idea here is really to beef up their ranks in order to file all, like, get all of these taxes processed. But it's mostly tax clerks and tax examiners that they need, the people who are looking over the uh, paper tax returns that some people are still filing. They're also looking to make these hires now and also into the fall. The idea is to minimize the backlog that we've already been talking about that is so high right now, Tom. Yeah, so if you file electronically, the IRS told me today that you should get your money in about 21 days if yep. you file electronically. If you file by paper, you could be waiting five to eight months for that money. And a lot, of people, a lot of people need that refund money to pay their bills, make the college tuition payment, whatever. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what father of three, Jermaine Key, told me in New Jersey. He is waiting on his $11,000 refund for his family. He applied for his, uh, he filed his taxes last week. And he said, look, I need that money because of inflation. The cost of my grocery bill is so much higher. He says that as soon as he gets that check into his bank account, he and his wife are going to go about dispersing it over the next six to 12 months, hoping to alleviate some of those high costs. So certainly the cost of living right now across America is the number one issue for people who are filing taxes. What you can do to speed it up is actually pretty simple. File electronically, but be sure to file accurately. Be careful the status that you're filing, making sure you're submitting all of your taxable income, especially if you received any unemployment benefits over the last or all, in any of last year. Okay, so uh, most experts say that you should file electronically if you can. Try not to file by paper, as you mentioned. Tonight's the deadline. What if you're just now waking up? You've been hung over for three months, <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, today's tax day? Your option is to file an extension, right? Talk us through that. Yeah, you can file an extension if you've been hung over or you're just a procrastinator, right? And that will buy you some time. But the key thing to know here is that you still have to pay up today in order to get that extension. Otherwise, you're going to face additional fees. Mm -hmm. Now, if the IRS, though, is delayed in getting your refund back to you and it's their fault in the case of maybe understaffing or other types of issues, then you actually earn interest on your refund. So that's something else to watch out for as you wait for your refund, Tom. 
Oh, you really think they're going to pay interest? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not so sure. They can't seem to get all these things done. But listen, hopefully, hopefully. I hope so too. <laughs> Joe, thank you. Joel and Kent. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much. Other news: The House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection is still meeting with former Trump advisor Kimberly Guilfoyle for a second time. Guilfoyle walked in earlier today for testimony to the committee that so far lasted, by our count, seven hours. Guilfoyle was subpoenaed by the committee after she abruptly ended a voluntary interview with the panel back in February. The former Fox News host and fiancé of Donald Trump Jr. was among the speakers who addressed a group of Trump supporters at a Stop the Steal rally shortly before the crowd then stormed the Capitol on January 6th. The committee believes Guilfoyle played a key role in organizing and raising funds for the rally while also meeting with former President Trump in the White House. Ali Vitali is in Washington, where this marathon meeting has taken place. And Ali, do we have any details about today's interview with Gil Foyle? Yeah, not yet, Tom, but what you just mentioned provides a roadmap for us to what the committee probably wants to talk to Kimberly Guilfoyle about. So much so that even after she voluntarily came in and then abruptly ended their first session, as you mentioned, several weeks ago, they then subpoenaed her early in March because they wanted to hear what she had to say. Today, she obliged that request, meeting with them by our count, you're right, more than seven hours at this point. And look, it comes at a time when the co committee has seen cooperation from some pretty key members of Trump's own family. Kimberly Guilfoyle, of course, engaged to Donald Trump Jr. Don Jr.'s sister, Ivanka Trump, and his brother-in-law, Jared Kushner, they testified in front of the committee themselves for several hours. Lengthy depositions there. Those, of course, were given voluntarily, but at the same time, it does go to show the committee is getting some cooperation from some of the people who are closest to the former president. Okay, so the select committee has interviewed more than 800 witnesses, issued more than 80 subpoenas yeah. so far. Uh, where do they go from here? A lot of big numbers there, and that's exactly what the committee would point you to, even as they're filing these criminal contempt referrals against the select people who are not complying with their subpoena requests. I'm thinking of people like Steve Bannon, Mark Meadows, and then most recently Peter Navarro and Dan Scavino. Those folks aren't cooperating, but by and large, a lot of the people who the committee have tried to talk to are. They are coming in either voluntarily or after subpoenas. The goal here, though, it's always been a race against the clock. Benny Thompson, the chairman of this committee, has told us in the halls of Congress that he really wants to start wrapping up the fact-finding and depositions phase by the end of the month, and then they want to move to a more public phase of public hearings. That's the thing that we've been waiting on, but the thing is, as they've gotten more information, there have been more questions, and we're still waiting to see if there's other people that they could subpoena. Specifically, I'm thinking of Republican lawmakers who we know spoke with the former president on January 6th, as well as his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Those are open questions that the committee is going to have to answer before they move to the public hearings phase and write that intermittent report before they file their eventual final report. And all of that has to happen before the midterm elections, Tom. Thank you. Uh, on a rainy day, Ali is uh, staying inside where she's nice and dry. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Appreciate it. Some 8 million people are expecting a blast of April snow showers as a nor'easter moves in tonight. It's bringing heavy snow, wind, and possible flooding along the East Coast, along with a very big drop in temperatures. Just look at all the folks in D.C. bundled up during the annual White House Easter egg roll today. Temperatures in the Capitol got up to about in the low 40s, I should say, following temperatures that we were all enjoying above 80 over the last week. Michelle Grossman joins me now. Uh, Michelle, listen, I'm from Colorado, and I'm used to snow in April and May, but snow on the East Coast yeah. in late April, that is a bit of a roller coaster ride for us here. I know. You are so right. Hi there, Tom. So good to see you. And it's all about location, right? So if you're in the Northern Plains, you're in the Rockies, you're used to it. But the Northeast, interior Northeast, could see a foot of snow tonight in the middle of April. So certainly wild. We're in the beginning of spring. We're battling between the warm air to the south, the cold air to the north. That's all trying to meet in the middle and overtake each other. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's happening tonight. Because as you said, at 8 million at risk for some sort of snowstorm. And it's a heavy, wet snow that we're going to be dealing with as we go throughout the 
the next couple of days. So a mini uh, nor'easter, we'll call it. Now, where you see the pink, that is your winter storm warning. That includes parts of New York into Pennsylvania, even into portions of the higher elevations of West Virginia. This is what it looks like on radar right now. It's a pretty big storm in terms of its size, right? So you have the southern part, the warm sector where you're seeing that heavier rain, the yellows, the reds, the oranges uh, south of D.C. And then on the back side, you're seeing that blue. That is the snow. And the white is the heavy snow. So, so again, some of us may see up to a foot of snow. And this is what it looks like for your snowfall forecast, generally anywhere from five to eight inches. But where you see the pinks and purples, we're going to see localized amounts up to a foot of snow, even a little higher in some spots. So be careful with the snow. Again, we're in that warm part of the season where it holds a lot of water, so you want to take a lot of breaks. You want to use smaller uh, amounts on your shovel as you kind of move it out of the way. We're looking at a lot of rainfall, too, up and down the coast here. Again, it's a nor'easter, so rainfall forecast one to two inches in some spots, even up to three inches. We're going to see coastal flooding tonight. We're going to see that northeasterly wind pushing that water onto the coast, so that's going to be another issue, and we will hear those winds howling. So we do have a severe threat as well on the warm side. This is down in Florida where we're expecting anywhere from winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail once again, isolated tornado possible, uh, but that is pretty unlikely. I think the biggest thing would be wind damage. And that's the good news with this. You know, we had four weeks of severe weather outbreaks. We're not expecting that tonight. We're not expecting that this week. So we're getting a little break from that, but we're dealing with this spring snowstorm. So for this evening, the storm slowly moves up the East Coast. It may produce some strong winds and also some small hail, especially in Florida, even parts of the Carolinas. North Carolina may see that, but that threat's going to be ending over the next hour or two. And then by tomorrow, as it moves up into Quebec, it kind of wraps in that cold air. We're going to see heavy bands of snow expected to the north and strong winds and cold rain along the coastline before it's out of here. By tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, we should see those snow showers kind of kind of coming to an end. And then it's out of here. But we are still cold as we go throughout the next uh, couple of days here. We're looking at temperatures in the well below normal tomorrow, about 20 degrees below normal tomorrow. Wednesday, we start to moderate. And then as we go towards the end of the week, we're looking much better. And then Tom, as we look at this map here, warmer than average. So there is an end in sight, at least for a little bit. This is the outlook, uh, 22nd through the 26th, where we have a big part of the country warmer than average. Back to you. All right. We're going to be looking forward to it. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, at least four mass shootings around the country over the holiday weekend. Three people were killed, more than 30 wounded in shootings that stretched from Portland, Oregon, to two in South Carolina and one in Pittsburgh, where some of the estimated 200 that were there ran screaming from a party at an Airbnb when guns were pulled, the chaos captured on social media. Two 17-year-old boys were killed. At least 10 others were injured. Police are still searching for the suspects there. But we are learning of a second arrest in the shooting at the mall in, the South, in South Carolina. And police are looking for a third suspect. It comes after a 22-year-old man was arrested for the shooting in which nine people were shot. His lawyer said Sunday his client shot in self-defense during a confrontation with other shooters. Coming up, InfoWars files for bankruptcy as host Alex Jones faces defamation lawsuits over the Sandy Hook shooting. What this all means for the far right platform. And the next time you see a movie, there might be a new way to pay. We'll tell you which chain is, well now you know it's AMC, is taking crypto next in the five things. Back now, InfoWars Wars, a media site known for spreading conspiracies owned by Alex Jones, is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in a Texas federal court after getting hit with multiple Sandy Hook defamation suits. A Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing can provide protection to companies and put a hold on civil, civil litigation so that the business can keep operating, unlocking time to restructure their finances. InfoWars is saying that they have estimated assets of up to $50,000, they say, with estimated liabilities between $1 and $10 million. Now, Jones was found liable for damages in a host of lawsuits uh, after he made the very false claims that the 2012 Sandy Hook school shooting was a hoax made up by gun control advocates. Jones later admitted it did, in fact, happen. But now his legal battles have really started to add up. Von Hilliard has the story. All these dictators.
Raiders and tyrants come around taking people's firearms. The media company run by Alex Jones, the front man for provocative conspiracy theories, filed for bankruptcy protection this weekend. I really need your financial support right now. It could be the last time you ever get an InfoWars t-shirt or a book or a film. Jones sitting for two days of depositions just earlier this month for a defamation lawsuit against him. It was just next level, like a hallucination or something. They start out with demonizing me. Defamation is potentially a destructive device used by plaintiffs uh, to bring cases against someone like Alex Jones and not just hit him for a big verdict, but also potentially drain his funds while he's defending himself. That shows how sick America is. As the host of InfoWars, the propagator of conspiracy theories has galvanized a mass following in America. But he's now also facing financial difficulties, found liable for financial damages in four defamation suits against him already. Those lawsuits over his promotion of lies that the shooting in Newtown, Connecticut was a, quote, giant hoax. And I'll just admit it. I could have done a better job on Sandy Hook. Some of the anomalies that we reported on were not accurate. But years after the 2012 shooting that left 26 dead, Jones continued spreading lies, claiming the families were crisis actors. In one lawsuit, he was ordered to pay out $100,000, but he could face even more severe financial penalties from the other lawsuits in the coming months. Will this bankruptcy filing threaten Alex Jones's ability to potentially pay these damages? There is a good chance that uh, all civil litigation will be placed on hold uh, while the company restructures its finances. Uh, the plaintiff's lawyers in this case are likely to argue that this is a last ditch effort on the part of Alex Jones to avoid having to ultimately pay the consequences for spreading these conspiracy theories. Jones at the center of pushing other conspiracies. He was outside an Arizona elections office days after the 2020 race as workers counted ballots inside. And then in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, spreading the lie that the election was stolen from Trump. But Jones using today's bankruptcy news to sell T-shirts and other merchandise. Don't let them silence us. And I see a lot of traffic on the store, I'm told, by the crew, a lot of visitors, a lot of people buying stuff. Great, because I need a lot of money to prosecute this war. Jones already banned on Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Now, the financial struggles as a consequence of his lies, putting his own platform on the line, too. Yeah, what did you say there? I need a lot of money. NBC's Von Hilliard is joining us now. Uh, so Jones has trials scheduled to begin this month in Texas, where juries will decide how much he actually has to pay the families in damages. Now, how does this bankruptcy filing impact what we might see in the Texas courthouse? The reality is, is that it could delay the civil litigation here, Tom. This is, we're talking about, he owes $100 million already here, and the potential further damages awarded by the courts could amount to much, much more. But when you're filing for bankruptcy protection, there's going to be serious questions about what assets he has here, and there's a potential that the court will have to take a better look at exactly where the financing of InfoWars is and the extent to which Alex Jones is currently in the position to be able to pay those damages. Okay, now the victims' families have talked about how they've been harassed and received death threats. People who've lost their children harassed and received death threats from Jones' followers because of what he said. So how significant is this moment for them, for the victims' families, their parents, for example? We're talking about, right, Tom, the shooting taking place in 2012 here. This has been long running, and it was only until recently that Alex Jones continued to propagate the conspiracy that the Newtown shooting was a hoax here. And you're talking about the potential that this case and these trials, these defamation lawsuits, are only prolonged here. What we're going to be seeing in the trial here ahead is these families be presented the opportunity to suggest the extent to which they have been damaged and their family has been damaged by Alex Jones and others propagating this conspiracy theory here. This is going to be a tough many months ahead. This bankruptcy protection filing only adds to that. Tom? Newtown happened. 26 people dead. Von Hilliard, thank you very much. Great reporting there. Uh, let's get you, get you over now to the five things our team thinks that you should know about tonight. Number one, thousands of South African soldiers have been deployed to help a coastal province that's been devastated by floods and mudslides. Right now, 
More than 400 people are dead. Dozens are still missing. It's been a week since the torrential rains first hit, and many are homeless or without power. Number two, China has reported three deaths linked to the COVID outbreak in Shanghai. Health officials there say the people who died were all over the age of 89 and unvaccinated. This comes as the city enters its third week, third week of a lockdown while fighting a new wave of infections. Number three, the California mom accused of faking her own kidnapping officially pleaded guilty today to mail fraud and lying to federal officials. Sherry Papini disappeared in 2016. She was found weeks later. She told authorities she was abducted, but actually she was staying with her ex-boyfriend the entire time. She will be sentenced in July. Number four, the FDA investigating whether Lucky Charms is making people sick. The agency received about 100 complaints this year with people alleging the cereal caused nausea, vomiting, and other symptoms. The parent company, General Mills, says it is taking the situation seriously. No recalls have yet been issued. Number five, the largest movie theater chain in the U.S. will now let you pay for your ticket in crypto. The AMC app is now accepting Dogecoin and Shiba Inu. I had to practice those three times, by the way. And other digital cash as payment. The company says the process is just as easy and all you have to do is select BitPay instead of your credit card when you're checking out. Yeah, I don't, I don't have that. Still to come, we know the U.S. is trying to crack down on Russian oligarchs as punishment for the invasion of Ukraine. But one tycoon was actually able to move his money before officials could get their hands on it. We're going to tell you how it all happened coming up after the break. Now with news that Florida is banning a significant number of math textbooks. Why? Because of references to critical race theory. We'll explain later in The Local. Now, though, we want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on here. Right now, Russian oligarchs are making moves. Uh, oligarch Oleg Deripaski's yacht, Clio, you see it right there, just arrived in Turkey, a country that supported Ukraine while opposing sanctions on Russia. And oligarch Roman Obermovich, reportedly just traveled to Ukraine in an attempt to revive peace talks with Russia, all as Western governments try to enforce sanctions against them. NBC News worked with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists to get a closer look at just how difficult it is to nail down the assets of those sanctioned oligarchs. These records show how one oligarch, Suleiman Karimov, uh, and his associates went to great lengths to move his wealth, and he has a lot of it. He is known as the Russian Gadsby, famous for hosting multi-million dollar parties. NBC's Kendallanian has the story. The U.S. government has a message for Russian oligarchs. It does not matter how far you sail your yacht. It does not matter how well you conceal your assets. The Justice Department will use every available tool to find you and hold you accountable. The attorney general announcing the seizure of a Russian billionaire super yacht in Spain. The first big success of a new U.S. effort to target oligarchs close to Vladimir Putin, who for years have been able to enjoy their villas, boats, and sports cars while traveling the world, even under U.S. sanctions. Stopping them won't be easy. These people socked away billions of dollars over years with the certain knowledge that one day a scenario like this would come uh, come to pass. And so they insulated themselves. NBC News was part of an international consortium of news organizations investigating how one Russian tycoon moved his billions. Suleiman Karimov was among three dozen business leaders briefed by Putin on the day Russia invaded Ukraine. His assets said to include a Boeing jet, a $325 million yacht, and a French mansion once featured in a Hollywood movie. In 2017, Karimov was arrested in France as part of a tax evasion case surrounding four luxury villas on the Riviera. Charges against him were dropped, and a company prosecutors linked to him paid a hefty fine. The U.S. government sanctioned Karimov in 2018, but leaked documents show even before he was sanctioned, companies linked to him and his associates moved $700 million across the global financial system. One of the firm's shifting funds listed a Swiss tattoo artist as its owner. The transaction so confusing, bank officials struggled to keep up. The problem is, is that there are so many transactions that pass through. They're drinking out of a fire hose. 
just back from Rome. NBC's Ken Delanian is here with more on this. You talked about it in the story, but the bottom line is some of these guys, the U.S. has been after before, but what's changed right now? So the Justice Department has set up this thing called Operation Klepto Capture, and they're actually prosecuting the behavior of evading sanctions. A lot of these guys have been sanctioned for a long time, and they move their money around, and there hasn't been much of an effort to go after that. But it can be illegal, and we're now seeing a task force of FBI agents, prosecutors, Treasury agents actually investigating this behavior and prosecuting it and trying to indict. Are they getting help, though, enough help from foreign authorities? They're getting some help, but the real problem is financial regulators are overwhelmed yeah. by this volume of transactions. They don't even know what they're looking at in many cases. And, you know, these guys can hire the best lawyers, the best accountants to move their money. Sure. Around. And they move it in a heartbeat. They sure so then do. you got to catch it. Yeah. All right, Ken, thanks. thanks Ken Delaney, appreciate it. Uh, still ahead, a boat capsizes, leaving two dead, two in the hospital. We're going to have more details on that accident coming up in the local. Plus, that major computer chip shortage driving up the price of cars and just about everything else. We'll look at what's being done to try to get that supply up and the prices down when we come back. We're back and a jury is deadlocked in the murder trial of a doctor accused of overprescribing drugs to patients. Details on that in just a little bit. But first, NBC News, as you know, covers hundreds of stories every single day. And because you can't possibly read, watch or listen to them all, Neither can I. Our viewer teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going on in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, two people are dead, two others badly injured after a boat capsized on the Long Island Sound. At first, rescue crews could not find the boat, but used cell tracking software to nail down the location. Authorities are still investigating, but say rough winds and waters probably caused the accident. From our Southeast Bureau, Florida's Department of Education has rejected 54 math textbooks for their K through 12 curriculum, the most in the state's history. Why? Because of references to things like critical race theory and social emotional learning. Critics say this is the latest move from the state to control public schools. And out to our West Coast Bureau, San Diego, getting money for affordable housing. A big problem there. The county has been awarded more than $20 million in federal and state funding. Housing authorities there say plans for five projects are meant to serve low-income senior and seniors and veterans. They hope this will be a step to fight homelessness in the state. We are paying, as you know, much more for just about everything. And we really need just about everything that are affected by computer chips. So we're paying more for food and gas and cars. Used car and truck prices up over 35% from March of last year. A big reason for the rise, a shortage in computer chips, which are used to power a lot of cars' electrical systems. The House and the Senate have passed major legislation separately, but both agree that more chips need to be made here in the United States. But the differences between the two bills are even bigger, and time is running out. The U.S. capacity to manufacture chips has shrunk 25 percent over the last 30 years, while China's capacity to continue to grow, threatening even higher prices here at home. Joining me now, NBC's Jake Ward out in San Francisco. Jake, how urgent uh, is the need to ramp up manufacturing here at home? We know the Biden administration has put a big push on this. Well, that's right, Tom. We have both now a House and Senate bill in the works that would try to shore this up, and it couldn't certainly come fast enough. If any of you have ever tried to buy or even looked into the possibility of buying a car right now, you know exactly what we are talking about. You know, in September of 2019, uh, the auto industry predicted that it would see about 3.5 million cars out on the lot. That's a normal year. Well, once the pandemic hit and all of those computer chips were instead redirected to all the equipment that we we were using at home to be on Zoom and away from car manufacturing. Well, now we have less than a million cars out on the lot. And that is why you just don't see them available. And the ones that are there are incredibly expensive. The auto industry is uh, recording record profits right now on the cars that they do manage to sell. So we are seeing it in really every sector of our modern lives. And that is because, as you know, Tom, shortages in chips mean a shortage in pretty much everything. Yeah, and I was one of those guys who was forced to buy a brand new car recently because my daughter crashed hers. And guess what? Used cars were more expensive than new cars. But even if Congress was able to pass legislation, uh, how quickly would we start seeing lower prices 
for cars and other tech products, do you think? Well, when we spoke with Pat Gelsinger, the Intel CEO, and visited a facility, one of several that he is building to the tune of about $10 billion per facility, he told us that he expects that the ramping up of production here in the United States, he hopes means that the uh, shortage that we have seen will slacken by about 2023, a year from now. Obviously, that is bad news for the Biden administration, who's desperately trying to get this going. Uh, you know, but we're also talking here about trying to make up a shortfall of trillions of dollars of investment and decades of time spending, uh, you know, government funding in countries like Taiwan, which set out to become the dominant force in the chip market and now makes 60 percent of the world's chips. The American capacity for making chips has just fallen behind, in part, critics say, because we have not put in enough public investment. Certainly these two acts that are under consideration, each of which would put about $50 billion into making up that shortfall, are, are part of the effort to try and close that gap. Yeah, we've outsourced chip production for years, but now the pandemic really isn't the only reason for the shortages, right? We have 5G cell phones and, and cryptocurrencies all demanding more chips. So if technology continues in this direction, then per, you one would assume it's going to be very difficult to supply enough chips to keep up, period. You know, it's interesting. We spent some time last summer with a company called Ombligo that essentially recycles chips out of common consumer goods and older model computers in order to bring them back. It turns out that you can use the same RAM in that again and again. We spoke to the CEO of that company and asked him just about the sort of institutional challenges to a world that needs as many chips as it does. And here's how he described what he thinks the solution could look like. We keep looking for something new to come from overseas to solve the problem where I think if large corporations were to look in their supply closets and, um, and consider how they, how they really decommission um, their equipment, it wouldn't solve the problem, but we'd, we'd make a pretty heavy dent in, in that problem. Now, Harris Hedelman absolutely says that we would need still new chips for the very most cutting edge technology. But the truth is we can reuse a lot of it. And it may be that going forward, we'll need both a domestic manufacturing capacity and a domestic recycling capacity in order to live the life we've grown used to, Tom. All right, Jake Ward, thanks much. Up next, we're hearing from Johnny Depp's doctor as the defamation trial against his ex-wife plays out in court. What we learned about the actor's substance abuse struggle straight ahead. Jurors will be back at the at an Ohio courthouse tomorrow deliberating the fate of a doctor accused of overprescribing fentanyl to his critically ill patients, hastening their deaths. The news comes after they told the judge earlier today that they were at an impasse in the case of William Huzel, who faces 14 counts of murder. But the judge sent them back into deliberations. They've been trying to decide the case since last Tuesday. Prosecutors said from 2015 to 2018, Huzel purposely gave patients excessive doses of fentanyl that caused or sped up their deaths. His defense argued prosecutors had not proven it beyond a reasonable doubt. Johnny Depp's private doctor and nurse today questioned over a 2015 incident in Australia when the actor's fingertip got sliced off during day four of the defamation trial against Depp's ex-wife, Amber Heard. Depp blames the incident on Heard, but she denies that. Depp's doctor tells the jury in recorded testimony that he treated Depp after this happened. He says he saw Depp bleeding heavily, but no visible injuries on Amber Heard. According to the doctor, Heard had claimed Depp threw her, threw her into a ping pong table and pushed her against a refrigerator. Depp is suing Heard for $50 million over an op-ed that she wrote in the Washington Post back in 2018 about being a domestic abuse survivor. Heard never mentioned Depp by name, but his lawyers, lawyers argued that it was clear in the piece that it was about him. Heard is countersuing Depp for $100 million. Both actors are expected to testify. Steve Patterson joins us now to talk about what happened today. Uh, Steve, a lot of today's questioning from Heard's lawyers focused on Depp's drug use and diagnosis that he's had bipolar type of disorder conditions and depression. Depp's team didn't shy away from that either, right? 
No, I mean, I think Johnny Depp, the strategy has been to be open and honest about his drug abuse and to paint Heard as the person that's been in the way of his rehabilitation and recovery. That's what it was for minute one. And I think the focal point of all of this where the largest body of evidence come for, comes from is that Australian incident. Uh, that being said, it's really still opaque, opaque and clearly muddy as to what happened coming into the trial and now. Uh, and, and this is really where Heard alleges a lot of the abuse happened, that Depp went into this drug-fueled, physically abusive tirade ending in this cataclysmic fight where we know that Johnny Depp's finger was partially severed. Uh, but, you know, it's a he said, she said. Depp and his attorney say was cut when he when heard threw a vodka bottle at him and heard says and her attorney say was he cut it off himself so testimony is centered really around Depp's private doctor who talked about that drug abuse who also treated heard uh, and there was testimony you know in a, in a text exchange between he and Depp admitting that Depp cut his finger off but then later the doctor also testifies that he never saw any physical evidence as you said that All right, so was ever abused in their relationship. So again, it's this cycle of who said what, centering yeah. on you know the the drugs that Johnny Depp took. Yeah, uh, we're also hearing from Johnny Depp's security guard, who says he told her that she and Depp would end up killing each other at some point or go to jail if they continue their fights. Right. Yeah, the security guard has obviously very close ties to Johnny Depp. He described a, a relationship of complete open access. He saw several of their scuffles, saying, you know, at points in their relationship that he saw uh, the different fights that they would have. But he says he never saw any physical evidence of abuse on Amber Heard, but that he did see it on Johnny Depp. Now, obviously, Johnny Depp. Uh, and this witness, and all the witnesses, of course, that have been brought so far, uh, have been Johnny Depp's witnesses, some of them under Johnny Depp's payroll. And that's what Heard's attorneys would allege. That these people are all paid by Johnny Depp, so of course they're going to say things that uh, paint Depp in a better light than Heard. Uh, but according to his testimony, he says that, again, he never saw any physical evidence that Johnny Depp intentionally abused Amber Heard, that she would often instigate the fights, and that she, in fact, was the abuser in many of the cases in which they cite that there was a scuffle. Tom. Steve, thank you. Steve Peters, Patterson out there in Los Angeles. That is a wrap for this hour. We'll have much more for you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. I'm Tom Costello in for Hallie Jackson. Our coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.